You ought to bless him. You ought to praise him. And you ought to worship him. Hallelujah. If you can stand, please do so in respect of the Word of God. I want us to go to Genesis chapter 1, familiar passage, verses 28 through 31. And it will take me a little time to build foundation of where I want to get to in this text. If you're there, say amen. Oh, they have it on the screens. And God blessed them, the man and the woman. And God said unto them, he's talking to both of them, be fruitful and multiply. That is my text for today. Those two words. And replenish the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish, the sea, over the fowl, of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree. And the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. Seed. To you it shall be for meat. And God saw everything that he made. And behold it was good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. My subject again is your seasons of fruitfulness have already begun. That should get somebody excited. So if you want to know about pruning, get the New Year's Eve. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for being the under-shepherd of this great people. That I can share your word with your people. And so I would ask, according to Ephesians 1.17, that you would give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Let the word of God become life and spirit to us as it is being taught. I want to thank you again that the seasons of pruning in our lives are over. And that the season of fruitfulness has already begun in Jesus' name. Somebody give him a praise. Amen. You may be seated. Please stay with me. I assume a lot of this you understand. Some of it, possibly not. When you come to the book of Genesis, Genesis means beginning. But the book wants you to understand that God is creative. And whatever God wants, he simply creates it. Whatever God asks, he answers. Whatever God needs, he provides. And that God's word is the vehicle through which he creates. So God simply says something. Let there be light, and there is light. It becomes what he says with whatever thought and intent he has in that saying. But I would have you to notice that when it comes to God's creativity, he does not have to be physically engaged to be creative. We many times do. He does not. If I want to build a house, I'm going to need some wood, nail, sheet, rock, concrete, all of those kind of things, lots of things. And then I would start working with my hands. That's how I know you build a house. I'm going to make it happen. I need all the materials, and then I will work according to the plans and specifications. But for God, he simply says, let there be house. And whatever his design and his thoughts are, It becomes that. And then he looks back and says, it's good. So, he says, I'm going to create this world. I'm going to separate the ferments from the water above, from the firmaments that are beneath the waters. And so he simply spoke it. They separated. It is good. So, I think everyone would agree that God is creative. You agree with that? And out of his creativity, you and I are here. This is important. Because we were created, according to the book of Genesis, in his likeness 
and in his image. In his image, looking like him, in his likeness, in the similitude to his matter. Simply meaning that if the creator created me in his likeness, then I am like the creator. Are you trying to say that you're God or that we're gods? Absolutely not. I'm simply trying to say that if you have been created by the creator, you were created to be creative. You with that? And if you're not creative, then you're not functioning the way he created you to function. You cannot be like the creator and have no creativity. Uh, If you don't know that, please write it down. This is what you need to understand about Genesis. So it might be a very important question to ask yourself. What is it that stops you from being creative as God meant you to be? What stops you from being like God? What's stopping you from stepping into horrible situations, void situations, chaotic situations, problem situations? What stops you from stepping in those situations of your life and being creative in them well if I'm in a big mess a big problem I don't think that's really where I should be creative God is so creative that he likes to step into a mess a major problem in fact to God his thinking is the ideal place to be creative is in a total mess. How do I know that? Because Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, verse 2, and the earth was without form, was without void, was without darkness upon the face of the deep, and still the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters. So if you are in a, catch this, if you are in a void marriage, you have the power to change it by your creativity if you... Your purposes, destiny, are in alignment. Imagine God saying, look at the mess on this planet. Look at the chaotic situation. Uh, Just dark is everywhere. Everything has no structure. Everything has no form. And I am not going to do anything with planet Earth until planet Earth gets better. And uh, when it gets better, then I'll step in and show my creative power. No, no, no. God says, my creative power flourishes best in a mess. Hmm. For every mess, there is a creative solution. might want to write that down. For every mess, there is a creative idea that will fix the problem. So my question, I guess, this morning, do you have a problem? Are you in a mess? Do you have uh, chaotic situations? Things that have no form, no shape, no structure, void, empty, chaotic. Is it confusing to you? Then you are in a mess, which means you highly qualify. If you are understanding, you've been created in the likeness of God to create an answer in a mess. You have that potential. The problem is most Christians don't understand that. But Genesis shows us it's a perfect place for you to be creative. Uh, How can I put this? Spiritual creativity thrives in chaos. I'm not talking about mind, soul, will, emotions. I'm not talking about the soul. Your spirit literally thrives in chaotic situations. Could I prove it to you quickly? The more chaotic, the greater the creativity. We have been in the United States for, what, 220 years, something like that, somewhere, I don't know. But if you will look at the history of our nation, most of the inventions that have come forth in America has happened in the last 120 years while we were still trying to settle into this new country that we have never been before. And uh, the motto became that need was our mother of invention. In other words, they looked at things like horses trying to go from the east coast to the west coast and said horses are too slow. 
We need to do something about that. Creative people, creative minds do not look at problems and worship the problem. Uh-oh, this is a real problem for most people because most people worship the problem as if it is a wall that you cannot climb over. And then uh, if we understand how God sees a problem, he sees it as an opportunity to be creative and then out of the chaos of the problem, creativity will emerge. But the issue is, do you believe that? Sometimes God puts you in chaos, please hear this, with the total expectation that you can handle it. Most Christians have never come to that revelation in the scripture. That's why I'm taking the time before I get to my text. Uh, simple example, there was a Christian woman who needed a job. She got a job typing. She couldn't type very well. Her boss said, if you can't do better than this, I'm going to fire you. You said you could type. And so she is making so many mistakes in that she knows she's going to get fired. She never did become a good typist. But that woman, who was a Christian, created... What? White out. She became a lot. See, the problem, you getting it? I don't think you're getting it. That's natural. We got to go spiritual. So, uh, uh, how many understand she now became a businesswoman? Uh, sometimes, here's the point sometimes God will put you in a problem or chaos. Because he has the total belief and expectation that you can simply handle it. Uh, I still don't feel in my spirit you got this. Do you really think that Jesus got inside of that boat, went down to the bottom with his disciples, he went to sleep, they were up top, and uh, he's fast asleep. Do you really think that Jesus didn't know that the, there's coming a storm? I believe he even created it because of what is said. So let me show you what I'm talking about. He is the omniscient God. Sure, he knows the weather, what it's going to do. So you have to ask the question, why does he go down in the boat and go to sleep? Why does he do that? Let me ask you the question, why does Jesus sleep in so many of your storms? Now I got your attention. He know, do you think he doesn't know that the storm is going to happen to you? Do you really believe that? Why would he possibly choose to go to sleep knowing that we have a storm that could kill us? And he doesn't do anything but remains asleep. How can you be asleep when the boat is being thrown every which way? How can you sleep? And Peter very frankly, totally trips out. And why is Peter tripping out? It's not like he's not an experienced fisherman. He's been in storms many, many times, and his life obviously has been saved because of his knowledge. But isn't it amazing? You can overcome things over and over again and come to one storm, and like Peter, just flip out. Just flip out. Why is that? It's funny how you can serve things or survive things over and over and then be confronted with something again and just trip out. Are you with me so far? Just to get to a place you can't handle it anymore. I've had it. I cannot deal with this. And so Peter, if you look at him, he is falling apart. And when people fall apart, have you ever noticed they blame everybody else for what's happening to them? So he goes down to blame Jesus. It's all your fault. Do you not care that we're going to die? What does Jesus have to do with the storm? He may have created it. He certainly knows it's coming. But Jesus is not the issue. Do you follow that? Peter's tripping out and he's blaming. He's, he's literally questioning God's integrity. And Jesus says, Peter, the problem's up, up, up on the boat and outside and around it. Uh, and so you're questioning my integrity. I wonder if you have ever been in a mess, a problem, a situation where you question God's integrity. 
over your situation. Carest thou not that we perish? How can you be sleeping at a time like this? Jesus wakes up, wipes the sleep from his eyes probably, comes to the bow of the ship and stretches his hands and says, Peace! Be still. And we talk about that example all the time, but we don't talk about what happened before he did that. See, there is something else he said that's very important. What did he say when Peter woke him up and is questioning his integrity? He says, Peter, you have such little faith. What does that mean? Why did you wake me up for this? What is Jesus trying to get across to Peter to understand? Peter, you could have handled this. Do you get that? So there are times that Jesus will remove himself from your problems because in his mind, he expects you to be able to handle this. What is it that you and I don't realize about ourselves that when we get into problems or storms or chaotic, we lose all confidence in ourselves and we do not recognize that you are in the storm purposely because Jesus and the Father and the Spirit think you can handle the problem. Hmm. Nobody's saying nothing. You don't have to wake everybody else up around you and freak out to handle your situation. You don't have to talk to everyone and talk about your situation as though it is your God. You are not worshiping at the shrine of your circumstances. Surely you have learned more than that. To worship at the shrine of your problems? Mm. Boy, you're quiet. Does this make sense? Peter, us, doesn't matter who. What you need to survive situations, problems, chaos is to understand that those problems are around you and not in you. If the problem gets in you, you're sunk. See, it's not a problem for ships to be in water. It's only a problem when the water gets inside of the ship oh you're you're not following me why is it that we don't know enough about ourselves to have never examined what's in us I know I need to give you a little time to think about it I'm going very slow I mean I know people who are in their 50s 60s 40s 70s and don't know who they are have never examined themselves. This is, this is very important to me. And see, I can forgive you for not studying the uh, theory of relativity. I haven't studied it either. Believe that it exists, whatever it is. But to not study you? That's absurd. To not study myself? That is literally absurd. To know more about other people then you know about yourself? What an indictment you're making about the God you supposedly serve. If you don't know who you are, how do you expect me to understand who you are? If you can't explain yourself, how can you live with yourself every day and you haven't even examined yourself to know what is inside of you? Because if you examine, you will find out what is in you. I, I have discovered in my walk with the Lord that there's much more in me than I knew. That I could put up with pressures that I thought were going to tear me asunder. And I was able to handle them because God purposely left me alone. And God wasn't there. And so I was on my own. And finally realized, I'm going to have to deal with this. I don't need to hear the... See, chaos has taught me, I don't know about you. Chaos, problems, situation, has taught me what is in Don Mears by God. Trouble has taught me what is in me. Denial has taught me what is in me. Betrayal and rejection has taught me what is in me. Are you hearing? 
I didn't know that I could stand up by myself. I didn't know that I could encourage myself. I didn't know that I could lift up my own head and strengthen myself. And I could simply ride the wave of that problem. There were times I would panic about things. I, I could have easily controlled if I had only known what was in me. I asked people for wisdom that was weaker than my own wisdom. <laughs> you identify with that? I've allowed people to advise me and give me counsel who had less. I should have never done that. I, and I'm just, I'm just talking about me. I know this has never happened to you. Bless you, dear one. But I'm talking about what is in you. And so my text being in Genesis, the creator is the only one who actually knows fully, completely what is in you. How does he know everything that's in me? Because he created you. All right? He has searched your heart. He has searched your soul, your spirit, your mentality, your intellect, all those things, your psyche. He, he knows your thoughts afar off, the scripture says. Better than that, he knows what you're going to say before you say it. He even knows the intents of your thinking and your thoughts. How do I know that? The Bible says the word of the Lord is quick and sharp as a two-edged sword, dividing uh, the marrow from the bone, dividing soul from spirit, listen to this, is a discerner of the thoughts. He discerns your thoughts and your ways and the intent of the heart. God not only knows what you did, he knows why you did it. He knows what you meant to do. If you didn't do what you meant to do, he, he, he has the capacity to know the intents of your heart and spirit. God said, I know what you meant, even though that didn't happen. Now, I don't know about you. That's why I've determined that I would much rather always allow God to judge me than people. Because people will judge you for what you did and they will have their own conclusions of why you did it and your motivation and people will not give you any slack and that wasn't your intent or your meaning. What's oh, Always I prefer God to judge me over people. And the word is my standard bearer. I can't violate it. Uh, I don't believe God wants other people to judge you because people will judge you on what you did, not knowing your heart motivation. I would rather be in the hands of God. Am I making any sense in this? Uh, than in the hands of people because my experience, maybe it's not yours, that people are very vicious, condemning, hateful, self-righteous people and they will judge you in a heartbeat. But God, the creator, made you from the dust of the earth, breathed into you the breath of life. You became a living soul. Not just a living person, but a living soul. It means that when you became a living soul, you have world consciousness. In your, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. In your soul, you have self-consciousness. In, in the world, your flesh has, your body has world consciousness. Uh, maybe that's when your body dies, you lose all your world consciousness. That's why dead people maybe aren't concerned about the weather. <laughs> Just saying. When your body dies, you have, <laughs> you have no world consciousness because your world consciousness is designed by God to appeal to your senses. Uh, touch, taste, smell, sight, all of that kind of stuff embraces your body senses so that you can have senses that keep you in touch with the world. When you die, you no longer have world consciousness, right? In your spirit, you have what? God consciousness. For God is a spirit. You embrace God in your spirit. You cannot embrace God in your mind. For you that keep trying to do that, please, it's a total waste of time. The carnal man is enmity against God, cannot discern the things of God 
because they will always come up as foolishness. Your mind cannot help you understand. When are we going to learn? Our mind, Brian, our mind cannot help us understand God. Don Mears, my mind cannot help me understand God. But your spirit, you have God consciousness. You can feel God in your spirit. You possess God in your spirit. You, you embrace God in your spirit. Uh, it's your spirit calling to his spirit. Uh, <laughs> the deep calling to the deep. Iron sharpening iron. I could go through this for a long time. So it is the body that I have, world consciousness. It is the spirit that I have, God consciousness. And then it is the soul that I have self-consciousness. Are we together on that? So what is the soul? The mind, will, and the emotion. So it's my self-consciousness that allows my emotions, my will, my decisions, all of that kind of stuff. Here's the point. It is the self-consciousness that gives me awareness of who I am in the soul. God has breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. He became aware of himself. Am I making sense? So you have self-consciousness, your mind, your memories, your affections, your appetites. All of that kind of stuff is locked up in your soul. I feel like I'm getting mundane and boring. I got to move on. And the biggest battleground is between your soul and your spirit or it can be your flesh and your spirit but neither the flesh or the soul can ever help you learn God know God possess God touch God it's impossible they're at enmity with God you either subdue them and have control over them or they will control you well how do I know which one's controlling my life who are you feeding the most not a hard question. So understand the principle. You can handle all of this stuff that is outside of you if, if it doesn't get inside of you. Can I hear somebody give me a witness on that? <laughs> Ships don't sink because they're in the water. They only sink when the water's in them. You can be in chaos and you can start going down. You can start allowing the problem to control you because the problem has gotten inside of you. Ooh. As long as it doesn't get inside of you, then you're all right. If the, if the problem has gotten inside of you, you're in major trouble. Have you ever been in a situation, everybody was panicking, but somehow you just didn't respond to the problem? You just, I'm good. And everybody else is panicking and freaking out. And you just, they say, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you upset? Why aren't you worried? Don't you understand the seriousness of this situation? I'm good. The thing that took me a while to realize about God, hear this. God is not just creative. Now, this is important. God is an architect. What does that mean? Well, architects build by design. Architects need specifications. They have to test weight loads on certain things according to the specs, knowing that it can take the weight. Architects build by design. Have you got that? They build with specification. God is much more of an architect than he is a builder. What are you saying? God builds by design. That's what an architect does. Um, when, look, let me quote scripture. Out of his design, God speaks. When the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God... The Greek word there is logos. It's not rhema, it's logos. And yes, it means word, but more than word, it, well, with word, it means thought. 
In other words, in the beginning was the thought, and the thought was with God, and the thought was God. All things were made by him. Without him, not anything was made that was made. So the word is expressed more than just speaking. In it, oh, Lord, I, I, I'm not going anywhere. I've got too much. I'm not even at the text. <laughs> the word is an expressed thought. Uh, real quick. When Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Do you understand? He never spoke to the fact that his brain hasn't had oxygen for four days. Do you understand that his blood is congealed? Do you understand that there's tons of medical problems from a dead person going to a live person to be normal? And yet all of it is contained in his saying, Lazarus, when he says that, everything he wants Lazarus to be, it's contained in his thoughts. Oh, you're, you're not getting this. Hmm. When a believer says they cannot handle their situation, their problem, their chaos, I'm telling you, you have been deceived. You can handle it. The only reason you can't handle it is because you are saying to yourself, I can't handle this. Because you're worshiping at the shrine of your circumstances. And God has never called you to ever worship at the problem. God wants you in the problem to worship his great creativity that he's put inside of you. And you can handle a lot more than you've ever discovered in your life. The problem is you've never examined what's in you. You're bigger than your circumstances. But as long as you think your circumstances are bigger than you, it will always take you down. You have got to stop this kind of thinking. It is against the ways of God. It's worldly thinking. Turn to someone and say, he is really nailing you to this seat today. He is stepping on you. Man, he is killing you. Architects build by design, by specification. So that to know that the design is going to work... The specifications have to test loads, right? Weight-bearing loads. Does that make sense in the natural? So Jesus, now catch this, is on the boat asleep. And he believes Peter is strong enough to handle the situation, whatever the storm was doing on the outside. And so he, in addressing Peter, in essence, the first thing says, Peter, why'd you wake me up? Why did you wake me up? Oh, ye of little faith. When he says, oh, ye of little faith, the whole essence is, I didn't need to be woke up for this. You were totally able to handle this. And he goes to the boat, says, peace be still. But let's not overlook what he's trying to get Peter to grasp. In essence, he's saying, Peter, Peter, you should have handled this. Understand, Peter, you totally flunked the test. Maybe that's why he, to some degree, passed the test of walking on water. See, this was Peter's opportunity to stretch out in God and for a chance for Peter to show what was in him, to withstand what you're going through, Peter. See, no, nobody builds something as an architect if they don't design it and test it Right? Uh, God says, I put you in a situation where you can discover yourself. You need to discover what's in you. I'll never forget the day that horses got loose Camp Adventureland and were running wild. And I ran and for an hour I was running after those horses. And they were teasing me. I'd get up 20 feet and then they would tear off. Until I just got frustrated. And I said, I command you horses in the name of Jesus to go back in your stall now in Jesus' name. They turned, looked at me, ran full gallop right past me into the stall, into the barn. That was a great discovery that day. Well, you don't have to clap because you don't believe it. It still happened. <laughs> Peter, you need to understand how much you can function under pressure. And Peter, 
try to get this. You will never understand how smart you are in your spirit if I don't test you. It is the test that literally proves, Peter, you took the class. Oh, I'm just throwing a lot of little gems out to somebody. So we're finally to the text. Now, I've taken all this time for a reason. I don't care how long I am today. If you care, you can get up and go. It is not only that God is creative. Now, catch this. God is systematic. What does that mean? God thinks in systems. See, a creative person would say in the situation God's in, let there be, and it would be, and that would be it. Let there be, and so it's created. It comes. But then if God needed more grass, he would have to say, let there be grass again every time there was a need. And God is not just creative. He puts systems into place. So when there is needed more grass, I've got to create grass. I'm tired of creating grass. But God goes from his creativity to his system. What is that? God is systematic through his seed. The seed is in itself. See, it's one thing to create a tree. All right? He created trees, full grown, spoke them into existence. It's another thing to create the tree with seed in it. Are you following that? See, it's one thing for God to create apples. It's totally another thing for God to have seeds in the apples. Because if there are seeds in the apples, he is letting me find the seed for a purpose. The apple tree can reproduce itself. I've created everything with the system. The system is everything I've created has seed in itself. And it will reproduce after its own. Am I making? you? Why aren't you talking to me? We're listening. We're listening. All right. So God puts a system in place. Now, in the scriptures that I read from my text, God put a system in it whose seed was inside of itself. And God says to the seed, uh, bring forth. Are you ready for this? This is heavy to me. Listen, God has no right to say to anything, bring forth, if he has not put seed in it to bring forth. Bring me your pocketbook. Bring me your wallet. Nobody's moving. Monica, whoever. Penny, bring me a pocketbook. Okay, whoever. Bring me a wallet. I can... No one's going to bring me a wallet. I'm not going to take your money. I don't care about your money. I can look at this all day long. Bring forth this pocketbook it's never I don't care how much faith you have the pocketbook can never bring forth a pocketbook because it has no seed in it the wallet can never bring thank you a wallet because it has no you're not catching this anything God puts seed in it we have a right to say bring forth if the seed is not in it what are you, dumb? You cannot have something reproduced that does not have the capacity to reproduce, right? So you can bring forth in Jesus' name all you want. <laughs> it is never going to produce another pocketbook. And I don't care what faith I have. There is no... <laughs> this is probably a little deeper than I should go. Why? The, the reason is it has no... <laughs> Therefore, you as an individual have absolutely no right to expect something to reproduce in someone if they don't have it, uh-oh, in them. When God says bring forth, the only reason he can say bring forth is because he knows that the potential of the seed is in it. He did not say create because he already created, now he goes from his creativity to his system of everything 
reproducing after its own kind. What's the system? He puts a seed inside of itself, and it can only bring forth what the seed is. You can pray for corn, but if it's a tomato seed, not going to happen. I don't care what your faith is. I've created you with a system, a cycle, whereby whatever you need will always be inside of you because I created you like me. You are created in my image and likeness, and I am the all-sufficient one. Do you want me to, to get into this? You know we're not at the text yet. Fruitfulness and multiply. But I need all this to make you understand fruitfulness and multiply. So the sufficiency that it takes to be productive only exists within the seed. And the seed is inside of the tree. So the creator has the right to command the tree to bring forth because it has seed in itself. He doesn't even have to command. He put that command in operation once. And that's why he doesn't have to ever create those things again on planet is anybody hearing me? You can only bring forth what is in you. Only if it's in you can it happen. Well, that really doesn't mean a lot to me. Really? Well, then why do you expect people to give you more than they have? A person can't give you love if they don't have it. person can't give you peace if they don't have it I was trying to speak in my car today to some other people I said let shalom there, there was no shalom present <laughs> if I don't have any I don't have any the fact that you need it doesn't mean that I can give it to you because you simply need it that does not create within me the ability to create something that has never put in me. This is heavy stuff. I can't possess it because I was never given it. So stop trying to get out of people what they don't have in them. Some of you are just wearing yourself out talking to somebody. Bring forth. Love me. Hold me. Talk to me. Be nice to me. I want what I want. Give me what I want. And the wallet says, I can't. I can't. I can't bring forth what you didn't put in me. You know, the saddest thing about Christians, they don't understand the most important walk in God. Oh, I could take an hour. I'd take 10 hours on this subject. The, the most important walk with God is not the walk of faith. If you think that, you just don't know your Bible. The most important walk is that God has put faith, or put love in our heart by the Holy Spirit, a measure, and we are to develop that. If you are not walking the walk of love, then forget you're being a person of faith because there is faith that worketh by love. Yes. Corinthians 13 tells us very clearly that faith has no comparative ability to stand against love. There's nothing more important than love, but the church never teaches that. Whew, I, when judgment day comes... You're going to be judged by what standard you developed your walk of love. I'm sorry to tell you, a lot of Christians are going to be doing very bad. Because that's never been the most important thing in their life. I'm sorry for that discretion or that whatever. The sufficiency is in the seed. Are we with this? So the sufficiency that it takes to be productive can only happen if it exists in the seed. I'm going somewhere, trust me. The seed is inside the tree, so the creator then has the right to command the tree to bring forth because he put a system in it. And so God says to us, bring forth, but it would be totally un. See, the command he's giving Adam and Eve, be fruitful, multiple, that whole command would be totally unjust of God if we did not have that potential in us. God would never command us to do something that we don't have the potential to do it. And the problem is our development is, is, is staggered. It, it's below where it should be because we never understand that the problems are there to sort of let us know what's in us. We're not learning because we're worshiping at our circumstances. That's a sin. Keep going back. 
What is in you by God is the only thing that can be brought out of you to become fruitful. Don't expect people to give you more than they have. I can't give you love if I don't have love for you. I can't give you peace if I don't. (laughs) And if I'm not giving it to you and I have it to give, then I am not in God's will. Ooh, 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 that hurts. That stabs me all over the place. I can't give you wisdom. (laughs) I don't have any. Peter, you're still a bit little retarded you don't know what's in you you should have never woken me up this was a test so you could discover what was in you you flunked the test Peter I'm sorry to say you totally flunked it but one day I'm going to give you some tests and you're going to tremendously excel in them and you will discover that you had more put in you by me than you could have ever imagined Take a moment to just meditate on that. God creates the man, breathes the breath of life in the man. He becomes a living soul. And the first first thing God says to both of them, be fruitful. Can't be fruitful if there's no seed inside of you. That'd be totally unjust of God to make that command. The fact that God made that command and you're not fruitful You're in major sin. It is what he expects. And look, God is trying to say, Hey, heads up. Get the bulletin. Pruning's over. It is your seasons to be fruitful. Now. They've already started. How long are you going to take to get it in your head? I'm going to test you and show you stuff that you didn't know you had. But stop worshiping at your circumstances and your problems and understand I may be going to sleep on purpose so you can arise up and find out and discover who you are. And creativity comes forth in chaos. Do you have it? Do you have it? Pruning season's over. This is my season. If if you're not fruitful in this season, man, You are so underdeveloped in me, it's pathetic. And again, no one ever takes the time to examine and study what's in you. And the only one... Look, the first time I ever preached, worst message in the world, it was just some scriptures, but God had spoken to me about a person in the choir that had a spirit of fear. And so at the end of the message, I looked at that person, had them come to the platform, and I said, you're totally bound by a spirit of fear. It took her an eter- uh, took the person an eternity to say yes, and I'm sweating. What if I'm wrong? All right, I discovered that the person not only as I understand got free, wrote a song for the choir about fear. Didn't even know that till months ago. But my point is, I discovered that day that I had the ability to hear from God what's in other people I I was a discerner and it wasn't odd to me when I had major people prophesy and tell me that you will have the gift of discernment in unusual ways can I go to something else just take a moment to think about what God first says to both of them he doesn't command them I don't want you to kill anybody I don't want you to commit murder I don't want you to lie I don't want you to steal I don't want you to commit adultery even though there may be nobody to commit it with but in your heart you're thinking about some tiger <laughs> why is it uh, there, there is probably mankind that is <laughs> the uh Ice ages. Uh, Most people don't ever teach on that. But think about it. The primary demand is not any of the stuff that we think is big. His first command is, listen up. I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to replenish. I want you to take dominion over everything. 
except me. I have dominion over you. As long as you can be under my authority, then you have authority over everything on the entire planet. Wow, that's a lot of authority. So God created you, and God put systems inside of you, and for you not to know what's in you is an absolute horrible thought because you refuse to take the tests and discuss. Oh, you, you catching this? Yes. See, you're, you're only going to be the happiest when you're the most fulfilled. You're only going to be the most fulfilled when you discover what's in you, put there by God, and start doing it. Uh, did you know that every day, like today, you should be fruitful? Every day, except one, Sabbath. And that's six days out of seven, you should be fruitful. Because you only have the chance to be fruitful one time in that day. And so I, I, I do believe in rest, but it's one out of seven. It's not six out of seven or five. Do we need to go down that lane? Because some people are out of agreement with God. And every day you're supposed to go further than the day before. And at every age and every stage, you are supposed to be fruitful. Do you get that? Now, I can't do at 69 what I did at 20. But that doesn't mean I am not to be fruitful at 69 at every age and every stage. But I know people who are in their 40s and never having any harvest or fruitfulness because they refuse to ever take any tests proving that you've taken the class. What do you mean? You're dumb as a box of rocks don't know what's in you. You have worship at the shrine of circumstances and problem. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep pressing that before I get to my stuff. <sighs> there are certain seeds I don't have in me. To play like the pianist played, I, I don't have that in me. I will tell you. It's not my passion. Took some piano lessons. Remember one song friend of Jesus or something, don't even remember the song. Probably can't play it. I don't have those seeds. So to discover what is in you is of the utmost importance and you can't discover it unless you go through the circumstances. He has to allow. Satan can't attack you unless he allows it. Satan couldn't touch Job. There's a reason God's allowed you, elder, to have a stroke. I suggest it's because as much as you've gotten tuned in on healing, you don't yet really know what's in you until you pass this test. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? All right, well, if it doesn't make sense, throw it away. Have you ever suspected that there's more inside of you than your situation or your circumstances or your problem? Have you ever suspected that you might be living way beneath your calling in God? Have you ever hung out with friends that said that, hey, you're my, you're my man, you're with me, so on and so forth. But you know in your heart that you're not one of them? Hmm? Are you aware that the most attractive people that will converse with you are always the people that see what's inside of you. Don't listen to what they said. Don't let them tell you on that job who you are. I see what's in you. I see your potential. You, don't you dare lose confidence in yourself at any point. I, see, that's what helped me for years with Marion when I was a janitor. Five years as a janitor. Having gone through college, being intelligent. My own man, leaving at age 14, I become a janitor. But it was Marion who said, I know who you are. It was Marion who stood by me. It was Marion who gave me the confidence. It wasn't, it wasn't the church folk. Oh, that Don Mears, he had the toilet ministry. It wasn't the church folk. <laughs> so, 
So in order to be fruitful, you have to be seedful. Does that make sense? You've got then to find out what seed is in you and what you then have to work to the stage of fruitfulness, right? Does that make sense? You've got to discover the seeds in you and work it to a place of fruitfulness. And God would not command that of you if it was not in you. So what is the potential? I, I can't grow corn if I'm planting tomato seeds. So big, big point. I now move to multiplication. You cannot multiply that which is not fruitful. And I certainly don't want to multiply my weaknesses, even though a lot of us do. Do any of you know why lions fight? Oh, I'm not talking about male and female. Male lions fight male lions. Do you, do you know why they do that? Young lions will come around when they think that one of them can beat the old lion who was the king of the jungle. It is the law of survival. The fittest will survive. You with me? And the reason they fight is so that they have the right to reproduce with the lionesses. And so if you can beat the one who's been the boss, then you have the right to reproduce with the lionesses. This is the way that nature makes sure that only the strongest survive. Right? Are you taking this and putting it into the analogy I'm going to use it for? You, when, <laughs> when you're trying to multiply your fruitfulness... If you don't have fruit, if you went through something and lost your fruitfulness in that area, you can't multiply. <laughs> you lost it. You can only multiply what you have. Am I making sense to you? Hmm. Nature's way. So God says, basically, do not multiply what did not survive. You can only multiply that part of you that made it through the fight, the storm, the winds, the heartaches, the pain, so that you cannot reproduce what you've lost. Hmm. What you've lost, you can't multiply. I can only multiply. If I, if I multiply what I lost, I am really dumb because I'm multiplying my defeats. Why would you want... And a lot of people do that. They get worse and worse in their thinking. Anything defeats them. They never learn who they are. They never discover what's in them. You multiply what came through. Do you not understand Peter when he walked on the water just for a little bit? Is so far above what he did with Jesus in the bottom of that boat. Why do you think he made any? Because none of the other disciples are going to do squat. So the Bible basically says after you've suffered a while, this is the Bible if it's important to you, after you've suffered a while, I will establish you and make you perfect. What does that mean? When you get through your crying, when you get through walking through the floor and walking on the floor, what's ever left, when the pruning is over, take what you got left, multiply it, press down, shake them together, running over. Multiply it. You're commanded to do that. He would not command you to do something that you don't have the ability to do. But if you have not discovered what's in you, then you've got to start where you're at. And God will let you keep taking the same kind of tests. Oh. Let's make a statement of faith because I want to quit. I have a lot of other things, but I've been up here too long for me. If I'm here too long for me, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> I need to quit. Turn to someone, look them in the face and say, I am coming. I am not coming. I am in. Right now, I am in. My harvest. I've been through the storms. I've been through the rain. I've been through the heartache. I've been through the pain. That's how I know that I'm coming into my harvest. I had to fight to get here. I've been scratched up. I've been mauled. I've been bruised. I've been cut. 
but I want the devil to know I am still here. Thank you, Jesus. You're not finished. You've been in a fight, but you're not finished. Now you have to take what has been fruitful and multiply it. So now I am in a season not just to be fruitful. I am in a season to take my fruitfulness to another stage of only the supernatural. Because you see, God, here's how he operates. You have to plant the seed. Not God. God doesn't plant the seed. You have to plant it. What God does always, the supernatural, is he multiplies the seed. When you come to the stage of multiplication, you're coming into the supernatural. And then you have to do the harvest. God doesn't do the harvest. You do the sowing. You do the harvesting. God does the miracle. When you are in the multiplication stage, you are walking literally in the supernatural of whatever you have discovered about yourself. And so when I discovered that I could speak to horses and they had to obey me, then I began to speak to other things. Had a little bird hit my window. I knew the bird was dead. Blood was bleeding everywhere. I went out and got the bird. In the name! Bird came to life and flew off because I started discovering what was in me because I had authority over horses. When clothes were moving two or three feet because I'd been out with preachers and they were telling demon possession uh, experiences that each of them had. And when I got home, I looked at the clothes for 45 minutes. Nothing happened. And then I could have sworn it moved that much, that much, that much. And then it was going two or three feet. And I ran upstairs and I said, Dad, you got to you got to come down to my room. There are demons. There are demons. There are demons that are being mad. Dad, you and I have to. And he says, "Here's what you do." I said, "Yes." What are we going to do, Dad? He says, "You're going to go down that room." Yes, we're going to go down the room. You're going to go into that closet. Yes, we're going to go in the closet. You're going to grab those clothes. Yes, we'll grab in the name of. Yes, we'll say in the name. Of, no, not us. You. And he fell over. I was too back to sleep. I was too young, not to understand. He didn't believe a word I was saying. But because he was my father, my covering, I believed him. So it took me a long time, but I got down the steps, went around. I'll never forget looking around that corner at the closet. They weren't moving. I felt good about that. Walked up to the clothes and grabbed them. In the name! Preached my first sermon to those clothes. Felt like I had power with God. I'm this. Do you not understand? I'm discovering. One is built on the, I'm discovering. I'm de- I, I just the other day realized that I have spoken the word of the Lord. I'm not proud about this. I'm just the mailman. I do what he tells me to do. But I've spoken to four or five individuals. You will die if you don't do this, and they die. By the same token, I've spoken to a few things that have been raised from the dead. I'll never forget my little kids coming in with their little lizard. Speedy. (laughs) And they had stepped on Speedy and his guts were all out. And Speedy was dead. And they came in. I was having a home group meeting, crying and weeping. Dad, would you pray Speedy back to life? And I looked at them. I said, no problem. But I'm in a meeting. You go back. All three of you lay hands. And you pray him back to life. They went back. And after a little bit, I hear all this shouting and whatever. Speedy has come back to life. (laughs) See, that's an experience that if they won't lose it. You're not finished. You've been in a fight. But now, not only to be fruitful, but to multiply. You can only multiply the fruitfulness that you have left. Don't ever try to multiply something unless you know God has said, raise it from the dead. And even though the bird was raised, I didn't say multiply. That wasn't... (laughs) I'm messing with you. Why don't we study by the leading of the Lord what is inside of us? Many of the greats in spiritual history have simply discovered. I'll, I'll quit with this, I promise. 
Smith Wigglesworth, who if you ever read books about him, is an amazing man. He didn't even get saved until he was, what, 57 or something? Didn't start ministering to 56, got saved young. So, I mean, in his mind, I'm not going to have much of a ministry. But he came to such growth and power with God that one night some wind hit his house, blew open the shutters, blew open the front door, made a ruckus, woke him up. So he steps out of his bedroom into his living room. They call it a parlor. And there in front of him taking a manifestation is the devil. He knows it's the the devil there. And Smith Wigglesworth looks at him. Oh, it's only you. I'm going back to bed. (laughs) Why would he have a conversation with the devil? He's a liar. I mean, you're going to believe what he said? You're stupid. That, to me, is the height of spiritual maturity. It's only you. I'm not going to waste my time talking with a liar. I don't know if you got anything I said today. I said a lot of stuff. Bow your heads. Close your eyes, open your hearts. God, we prayed for a head full, spirit full of revelation and wisdom. And we're praying for that to happen to us inside of us. God, I pray that everyone feels like I feel. I have been in fights. I've gone through obstacles. I have fought to get to where I'm at. And I didn't survive all of that not to get a shot at throwing my rock. And walk away. Uh, the, The devil's a liar. Father, so I ask that your revelation would sweep the aisles now. A revelation of who we are. A door opening saying, let me start showing you who you are. To do that, I've got to put you in some situations. Are you up for that? I see no, not one person says yes. Understand. I, the reason is because I'm in you. I, uh, you only can live, move, and have your being because I am in you. I've spent too much time in my life looking at all the bad things, the circumstances, the chaos, the uh, uh, problems. Instead of looking at all that is great in me, the sin that it would be not to know what is in me, Because I keep flunking the tests. And so, God, I pray that we will have personal moments together, moments of revelation. Let that happen all over this room right now. That they would catch a revelation of themselves. What you created them to be. Because they will never know who they are until they know who you are because they are in you. We live, move, and have our being. Let those that are lost, those that are lame, and those that are blind spiritually... Bring them to restoration until those people that I'm speaking to can dream again. Restore us where we can think with our spirit and have God consciousness. Restore us until we become so creative and then systematically start showing our fruitfulness to modernize what it means to be fruitful. Fruit we call produce. To be fruitful is simply to be productive. God, let us understand it's our time. And we'll miss our time. We'll miss our season if we don't step forward and understand that now we are to experience fruitfulness and then multiply what has come through the stages and the ages into another supernatural level. I guess what I'm saying, Lord, is that there are too many people in this room who are stagnant, in a rut, doing the same old thing. They're very predictable. Do the same thing the same way, same time every day. They have lost the excitement of walking with you, expecting revelation of what's in them. Give them revelation, not just of the Word, but revelation of who they are and what they can do and what they can reach. God, give every dad in this place a revelation of how they can take the situations that they're in 
And instead of viewing it as chaotic, be creative. Give every mother in this room a revelation of who she is, her value, her worth, what she can do and what she can be and what she can reach. Give them revelation of who they are in you. Let them start examining. Start praying again. God, give every marriage revelation so they can appreciate what they have and what they can become. So appreciative that they would become creative again. Give every single person a revel. Oh, God, help me on this. Give them a revelation, every single person, that they don't need somebody to complete them. Give them the kind of revelation that makes them so happy with life that someone will come along, the right person, and simply want to join the party. Give them the kind of revelation that stops them from putting the party on hold. It's it's time to not keep our celebrations down and just keep worshiping our problems. Let the right person join the party.